Hello, welcome and thank you for joining us for, for an event, another event in our um, Sustainability Week here at Imperial. Um, this event is sponsored by our Transition to Zero Pollution initiative, which, which I hope you all know is, is one of the pillars of the college's academic strategy. And it's an initiative that tries to connect across the college, um, academics and students um, and all staff who are interested in creating a, a different kind of future, a sustainable future, whereby we take a whole systems approach to, to study some of these rather complex systems. And what we're going to talk about today is, is a really great example of a, a super complex system that, that the challenge of urban mobility and how we create a future where we have mobility in cities and towns that is both clean and accessible and fair and, and, it, and it's not this is obviously not a, not a trivial challenge. So what we're going to do today we're going to have a, a series of short very short presentations just giving some context to, to some of those different aspects of this challenge um, and then we're going to have a, a panel discussion for about half an hour. So we welcome your questions in the Q&A. Um, please, please add those in as you're listening to the presentations or as the discussion develops. Um, and we hope this is a really interactive session. So, so without further ado, I'm going to introduce our first speaker. That's um, Professor Robert Shorten, who is a professor of cyber physical systems and, and deputy head of the department of the Dyson School of Engineering um, and, at Imperial College. Over to you, Robert. OK, so as Mary said, thank you, Mary. Uh, my name is Robert Shorten and what I'd like to do today is talk about three innovations for cleaner mobility and then tell you why these innovations don't really matter, at least without further refinement. So when we think about environmental innovation and technologies that have helped, uh, you know, to reduce environmental footprint, we might think of things like electricity or even more renew recent renewable technologies such as solar tech or wind tech. Um, but it might be a surprise to a lot of people listening that at one point the automobile itself was seen as a big breakthrough in environmental technology because it was seen to solve one of the biggest challenges of the day and it was another emissions challenge and it was the emissions challenge related to, to, to the horse, okay, which was at the time viewed as being a major health hazard. And of course now um, in the automobile the, the, the car is, 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 is in view again because of other emissions challenges, be it uh, related to global warming or, or, or pollution. And when I say pollution, I mean pollution, uh, airborne pollution or, or, or other forms of pollution that maybe goes into the waterways. Um, and and, um, and um, what I'd like to do is, is talk a little bit about the, 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 the way we innovate and, 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 and the way we think about uh, innovation in the context of the automobile. And roughly speaking, um, innovation, uh, automobile innovation, it manifests itself in three different ways. There's innovation related to policy, innovation related to new technologies, and then there's what I call platform innovation, and that would be uh, innovative mobility solutions that uh, provide maybe an alternative to the automobile. Okay. And uh, my argument and my provocative thought for the day is that the way we're thinking about these the, this, these types of innovations. Uh, don't really matter because what they're trying to do is they're trying to preserve the status quo. They're trying to preserve the way we use uh, cars, and 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 not not thinking about the bigger picture. And to give you an example of some of the some of the issues that that arise, um, let's just think about policy for a moment, okay? And legislation. Quite often, when we talk about policy and legislation, we try and force automobile manufacturers to build cleaner cars, but we tend to think in terms of per device emissions, okay? And it's well known in economics that when we uh, introduce a technology to make uh, technologies better, quite often what we do is we stimulate growth for that product, right? So, so as we make vehicles cleaner, we actually end up selling more vehicles. And it's because and because the aggregate effect is what's important, um, we might end up in a situation uh, where we make uh, uh, pollution worse rather than better by making vehicles cleaner. And that's something that actually happened in Ireland in the early 2000s, this, this curve is from Ireland. So, 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 so one flaw in the way we think about, about policy is that we don't think about the aggregate dimension, we think about a pair device dimension. In terms of new technologies, you know, electrification, electric vehicles is seen as being the, the, the great hope in terms of environmental innovation in our cities. But again, this is, there's a more nuanced view of, of the impact of electric vehicles and, and hydrogen vehicles because these vehicles still have tires and tires wear and rubber particles end up becoming airborne or in our waterways because of tire wear. 
and, 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 and in fact, electric vehicles might even be worse than conventional vehicles in this regard because they're heavier and because they have higher torque than conventional vehicles, roughly speaking. So, so the environmental footprint when it comes to tires for electric vehicles is actually worse than, uh, than, than conventional vehicles. And that's something that's al almost always overlooked. So you might ask about what about these new mobility services like on-demand mobility? And yes, they do empower new choices for people that sit inside of cars and they do make more efficient use of cars, okay? But is it really more efficient to take people out of public transport and give them their own personal device that contributes to congestions, contributes to tire emissions, contributes to other forms of emissions? So again, a more nuanced view of what we're doing needs to be considered here. And the final example I wanted to give was micro mobility. You know, you see a lot of electric scooters appearing, uh, you know, in our cities at the moment. Um, and, you know, on the face of it, they seem like a really good solution. But one of the big issues around uh, electric scooters is that they have batteries and, if, and the batteries are small and small means they're disposable, right? So what the question is, what happens to all of these batteries at end of life? One, a reasonable question might be, are we replacing an NOx problem with a lithium ion battery problem in, in a couple of years? So the question is, what's missing? Well, there are two things missing in my view, okay? So one is when we think of uh, innovation or when we innovate with respect to the automobile, we almost always think of the occupants of the vehicle. Okay, We hardly ever think of the, uh, the people outside the vehicle. So, so one argument I would make is that we need to, when we, when we innovate, we need to give due consideration to those people outside of the vehicle, be they cyclists, be they pedestrians, be the other stakeholders in their cities. And that's almost never the case when we innovate. And the second, uh, the second thing we need to do is we need to address the, the fact that people often don't have good choices. We don't need a car for every journey in our city, and but but people can't make the choice of not being getting into their car because, well, quite often because of poverty, you know, because they don't have access to an electric uh, bike. They don't have access to a Brompton bike that they can that or a fold up bike that they can that 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 they can uh, that they can use in 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 conjunction with public transport. So so one of the big issues I see is that people make bad choices for good reasons, a the, i.e. they might be poor. And what we need to do when we innovate is we need to we need to empower good choices. And that's one of the reasons why the mobility hub is so exciting. So to summarize, uh, uh, what my view of this is that cities are for people. Cars are not just for occupants of the vehicle. They're there for everybody in our city and we need to think of both stakeholders. And a key issue as we go forward is it, when we innovate is that we provide accessibility to good choices for people to enable them to make better choices. Thank you, Mary. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. OK, so, so some provocative thoughts there. Um, I'd like to move to our second speaker, who's um, Dr. Audrey Dinazel, who's the senior lecturer and, and uh, deputy director of the Center for Environmental Policy at Imperial College. Audrey is also the, the lead of one of our networks of excellence, which is a, a cross college activity focused on air quality. Um, so that really, I think, ties into some of the other aspects, the environmental aspects we want to touch on today. Um, so I'm going to hand over to you, Audrey. Thank you. Many thanks. Can you hear me? No? Yes. Okay, Good. great. Uh, well, thanks for inviting me. It's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, too bad we're not in person, but um, uh, lovely to be here anyway. So I'm going to talk about the benefits of active travel now. Now, in the context of sustainability, we know there are many, many different roads to reaching uh, sustainability and sustainability targets, whether they're greenhouse gas emission targets or air pollution targets, for example. Uh, but I think we tend to forget that the road that we take does matter. The method we use does matter. And we tend to go for what I think are relatively low hanging fruits uh, and very narrow minded solutions, such as uh, technological uh, solutions uh, in particular. But really, once we've taken out every single one of those cars and replaced them with an electric vehicle, are, really, are we really going to be much better off? Or can we really uh, instead uh, rethink the way we plan our cities and envision uh, cities and streets in which benefits in multiple ways and not just in that narrow-minded target such as air pollution or greenhouse gas emission targets. So I'm going to show you just a few examples of some research that demonstrates some of the benefits of active travel and particularly in comparison to um, car approaches. So this first example is um, 
a health impact assessment modeling uh, work that I, I've done with um, one of my PhD students, Andrea Calderon. And what we did is uh, assess the health impacts of policies that were in the London air quality strategy and look at the um, impacts from two perspectives. One was the physical activity benefits and the other one was the air pollution uh, benefits. And what you see in the X axis here is the number of deaths per year that were avoided. And we compared technological solutions that were in their quality strategies, low emission zones, electrification of vehicle fleets, diesel to petrol cars, and then compared these to behavioral solutions that entailed a modal shift from driving to walking, cycling and public transportation. And what we see is that, of course, there are benefits for both uh, um, all, for both types of uh, solutions. But when you compare, because the uh, the technological technological solutions didn't have physical activity benefits, we ended up obtaining uh, two to fifteen times higher health benefits from the behavioral solutions because of the physical activity benefits from uh, walking, cycling, or even uh, a bit of physical activity in public transportation use. So, uh, so clearly, you look at a, you, you see a different picture in terms of the most advan advantageous solutions when you have a bit more of a holistic thinking and uh, the outcomes. But of course, um, that, that's a bit of the tip of the iceberg, mortality impacts. But there are many other types of benefits that we can envision from walking, cycling, uh, active travel, my, my career, uh, environments in general. So. Physical activity is the one for which we have really the most robust type of quantification possible, but there are other types of benefits that are out there that we can also uh, start to quantify. Let me give you a few examples. Uh, for example, how we feel about our health, self-perceived health. We did a, as part of a European project called PASTA, we did a survey of close to 10,000 uh, participants in seven different cities across Europe and asked people about their daily travel habits and how they felt about various aspects of their health. So in terms of self-perceived health, we saw that people who walked or biked, the more they walked, the more they biked, the more they had a good feeling about their own health. And that was a statistically significant association. All the other travel modes, the more they used these other travel modes, there were no statistically significant associations in terms of how they felt about their health. We found similar results in terms of how people felt about their mental health, about vitality, that's the sense of how much energy they feel they have, about sense of loneliness or social interactions. In all these cases, the active travel modes led to significant improvements in these outco outcomes. Well, that wasn't the case in the, uh, the other modes. Now, the one exception is in terms of loneliness, where we did find that uh, the car and motorbike modes did uh, decrease also a sense of loneliness. We also had similar impacts in terms of self-perceived um, stress. But in the case of stress, we were also able to measure the stress objectively using galvanic skin response. So I'm showing you here the results of our objective measurements of stress. And we saw that people who cycled or walked compared to any other activity decreased their stress level and um, objectively measured, while as people who use motorized transport versus any other activity increased slightly their stress level, but with significant impacts. Um, we something that might also be of importance to uh, for some of us in terms of engaging people towards that vision is how we um, uh, is our weight gain. So we saw in our a study that uh, people who uh, biked versus people who drove, um, people who biked, the more they biked, the more they uh, had lower um, uh, weight, body mass index, while as drivers had higher body mass index, the more they, they drove. And we saw, in fact, an, on an average, a four kilogram difference between drivers and cyclists. And our longitudinal analysis also confirmed that, uh, these findings. But think also of all the other good uses that we could have of the space taken up by cars. Uh, particularly green space, play streets for kids, uh, places for the community to get to, uh, together and interact when we do get to interact again. So there are lots of different benefits of active travel. Some of them can be quantified and, and we can engage stakeholders with it, but some of it is just a question of how we engage people to have that desire for that uh, those, uh, those types of environments. So I think there are, again, multiple ways to reach sustainability. And the question is, uh, we see that we have lots of different benefits of active travel, but how do we make it happen is, I think, the big question. Thank you, Mary. Thanks, Audrey. Really, really interesting. Some really interesting data there. 
So I'm going to turn now to George O'Connor. Um, George is the Managing Director um, in Ireland for Enterprise Holdings um, and he's the lead enterprise for the new urban mobility pilot that hopefully George is going to tell us a little bit about um, in his presentation. I think along with, I guess, more of a and you know the enterprise perspective on what, what the future of mobility is. Thanks, George. Thanks very much, Gary. Yeah, great to see you. And uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Delighted to be working with Imperial. Um, much like Bob, my last job was in Ireland. I moved into an, an EU role now and in this mobility space. And um, so it's very exciting to be here. Uh, first of all, to give you a tiny bit of background in enterprise, we're the world's largest ground transportation provider. Uh, we've almost 2 million vehicles worldwide, but 80,000 employees um, and about 10,000 locations and a 20 billion plus uh, turnover per year. So most people, when they think of car hire, they think of airports and holiday. Enterprise business started in 1957 in the States, providing actually replacement cars. So our model was based on when people's cars were stolen, broke down, got in an accident, a company needed extra vehicles. That's actually where our model started. It did not start in the leisure sector or in the tourism sector. It's there today, but our primary foundation and our mainstay business is actually providing domestic mobility. So our entire business has, has developed over the last 60 plus years with having lots of locations in local neighborhoods close to where you live or where you work. I share that with you because I think it is helpful um, as we try and explain maybe some of our views and we certainly don't know everything and we don't think we're right on everything. Um, but as we sh share our views around the distribution of the services that the users will need, where we bring together the theory, the technology and then the distribution of the end service. So that's who enterprise is. That's who, who I am. We'll jump on to the next slide. Well, there we go. Thank you very much. So in, in terms of, of mobility, um, it means many things to many people, I think, as, as everybody's well aware. Um, it can seem very far off. Um, it's everything from driverless cars to hydrogen powered hovercraft to amazing technology. Um, and you hear a lot about 2030, 2040, 2050, um, which is, is a long way away. So um, we're also interested in today and what we can do today and deliver um, on some of the solutions that maybe people would like to test or try. We are probably of the belief that the end product has not yet been developed or the end service has not yet been developed by any one market. And what we see right across the world, but particularly in Europe, are um, lots of cities and municipalities really trying to figure this out. Lots of things working, lots of things not working. So this um, partnership with Imperial, where we can actually um, act and put together some solutions uh, and get some user experience and feedback is hugely important and valuable um, because I think it's quite an imbalanced debate at the moment. It's mostly theory um, uh, and it needs to be balanced up with probably more practical testing and applications of the theory. So it's a fabulous opportunity to work with I Imperial and Brompton. So if we jump onto the next slide. So on, on the zero emissions by 2050, um, a lot of this is coming from uh, regulation in many of the countries across um, Europe and in the UK. Um, huge push for cycling, um, creating more funding for infrastructure, trying to improve consideration of cycling and trying to pr promote active movement. I mean, Audrey's slides were spot on. Um, they speak for themselves. When, when people do engage in active movement, they, they, they feel better. They are better. They're healthier. It's good for everybody. And most people want to live in, in cities that are relatively quiet, have clean air and are not overly congested. So oftentimes people will look at enterprise and say, but you guys are a car company. Um, uh, you know, where, wh how do you see this world? So we're actually huge supporters of active movement and uh, cycling. And we often talk about the six wheel solution where we see the marriage and the combination of a bicycle and a car. It, there's probably isn't one particular mode of transport that's the solution to everything, but a healthy ecosystem um, that's, that supports choice and incentivization, so it's available to all in society, probably is a solution for everybody. So enterprises interests in this area is to continue our journey of, of distributing domestic mobility solutions. Uh, so as I referenced earlier, we started there in 1957. We bought our first vehicle, hundreds of people used it, and then we sold it back into the marketplace. So actually things haven't changed all that much. It's really now about collaboration and how do we reimagine cities 
and align with government policy and, and residents' aspirations. So if we can jump on to the next slide, that'd be great. So that brings us into what we hear about mobility as a service or mass. Again, can mean very, very, very different interpretations depending on who you speak to, but it's essentially bringing together a number of different solutions into one place on your phone or on a platform and to allow you the choice to be able to select um, the mode of transport you'd like to select to um, deliver on the journey that you need to take. It can be everything from a very basic platform of one or two items available to you to a very intuitive, live time, um, you know, highly technical platform that has all that goes with it when it comes to data and APIs and everything else. So again, across many cities across the world, there's lots of different providers of technology platform. Enterprise actually has their own multimodal platform um, that we work with some governments on uh, as a potential. We would then also supply a service to it. Sometimes we would view it as we'll supply a service to somebody else's platform, depending on what's happening um, in that particular city at that particular time. So I'd like to, on the next slide, I'd like to take a quick look at, at what, what we sometimes talk about good mass, bad mass. So mobility as a service, what we think is healthy and good is when the implementation is in consultation and it's public and privately led. Um, so you have that uh, research led, um, user need, resident need, all feeding into one place and it's aligning with government policy. Some type of license agreement where the platform or the technology platform is governed by local government. So again, we don't end up at loggerheads or the suppliers don't end up at loggerheads, scooters all over the place, dead batteries, all those kind of things that have happened in certain cities. We think commercial integration of all mobility services in a municipality is important. There can't be dominant players who continue to be dominant per se. Um, if you end up in a dominant position, it should be due to user experience and you, you've delivered a service that users wish to use and refer other users to. It can't be a case of there's a dominant provider who will then, you know, lock out new innovations or, or, or new companies that have solutions. So that, that collaboration and big and small not being important and everybody um, collaborating is very important. Um, and again, probably the one we think is most important, ensuring mass is aligned with the public policy objectives, everything from clean air to emissions to congestion um, to even multi-occupancy vehicle sharing as a commute type solution uh, to and from workplaces. What do we think is not so great um, if, if mass develops uh, would be a commoditization uh, of a supply chain. Again, if you've got a dominant player, um, that took over the platform, you could get into a situation where actually the needs of the users are not the primary objective, it's a commercial objective, um, and often commoditization brings poor service experience, lack of transparency and pricing and structure and, and lack of access. So, so we, we, we would be against that. Um, uh, not giving access or priority to other transport modes you know, over others, it's got to be let the users choose, let's learn from it and let's figure out where we need to fill in the gaps. Um, uh, if it fails to reduce congestion, um, uh, well, then it really hasn't, uh, you know, achieved its its objectives. So again, Bob touched on it with the assets. Uh, very important that we see an efficiency there. Needs to work for the public good, and we certainly don't end up where whatever service is delivered in a city puts the private sector at odds with the public sector and residents and active travel supporters. That 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 won't help anybody. So the last slide I'd, I'd like to talk about is the Brompton an enterprise and imperial hub. So this is about action. So again, huge thank you to Brompton Bikes, huge, huge, huge thank you. And, and to Mary and Imperial and everybody on, on the Imperial team, because um, now we've got an opportunity to act. So um, the mobility hub uh, at Imperial will have an electric car, a hydrogen car, um, it'll have about 20 um, push bikes, pedal bikes from Brompton and about five electric bicycles from Brompton. And hopefully where we end up uh, with this process is we'll have a couple of sets of user groups. Um, they will choose to maybe um, consider and try modes of transport they haven't thought about before um, and doing it regularly. So we hope to see lots of people consider cycling to and from Imperial or in between um, you know, campus. We hope some people will try the hydrogen vehicle. We hope some people will try the electric vehicle. Um, and then we'll be able to understand what choice they made and why. And the students uh, will be able to identify through their surveys and their research what the user experience was really like and what it's all about. So, so again, there's lots of theory and there's webinars every hour of every day about mass and mobility across the globe. There are very few examples of effective mass that's aligning with public policy 
is helping the residents and the users is available to all in society. So we greatly appreciate this opportunity with Imperial to act um, and to take the research into a practical application. And who knows, maybe we'll be able to scale it across the world when it's all over. So, um, so thank you very much, Mary, and thank you to everybody in the Imperial team and the Brompton team. We look forward to working with you. Thanks, George. And yeah, it's a really exciting programme. I'm looking forward to seeing how it develops. Um, so we're going to move into more of the panel discussion space. Like people are already putting Q and A into the into the questions, so that's that's great. Please keep adding them. You can also vote on the questions that you like. So if there's something you all really want me to ask, then if you all like it, then I'll know. Um, so, but first of all, I want to introduce our final panelist, who is Justin Abbott, and he's a member of the Better Streets for Kensington and Chelsea, um, which campaigns for safer and healthier streets um, around and about Imperial College, at least our South Kensington campus, anyway. Um, so, Justin, I'll just give you just a couple of minutes, just to, I guess, set a little bit of context about about your background and and, and what the Better Streets initiative is about. Okay. Great. Thank you. Um, hopefully, hopefully, this is all working and. Um, Yes, and just actually maybe looping back to what Audrey was saying about the more holistic um, benefits of active travel. So you're right, it's safer and greener, but also happier. Um, and, and that for us is, is, an, is an, an important point. So and we have a particular campaign on, on High Street Ken, which we'll, we'll come back to. But super briefly, I suppose my, my background, I grew up in London, always liked the freedom even as a child of being able to get about on, on a bicycle, much to my mother's horror. Um, and I, I particularly like bikes, so I ended up later in life working for the, the governing body of, of cycling in, in Switzerland. But before that, I was working in um, healthcare in sub-Saharan Africa. And, and there are a couple of things which I guess I sort of took away from that experience, which translate to, to the questions we have here. What, one is um, the impact on morbidity of inactive lifestyles. And, you know, when you're running a hospital group, you have to, of course, plan your business for what health needs are going to arise. And it was very striking seeing the change happen there. Um, and it's, you know, when you're actually building a business plan around it, it it's, it's rather real. And then the second was seeing that, you know, I worked a lot in Lagos and seeing effectively an arm, literally an arms race, actually, in congestion. So to get about town, it's literally an arms race because traffic is so bad, you get an armed escort to be able to get yourself through the traffic jams uh, quicker. And what struck me was we in Kensington, Chelsea, are sort of doing the same thing. It's another arms race of who's got the biggest SUV. And how strange to be going in the same direction. And yet in our Kensington, Chelsea, it's one of the richest places in the world. So resources aren't a problem. We're not dependent on some new invention. So this is just a choice. It's just a choice that we could make. And so a couple of years ago, um, I and some others, you know, got together. Of course, there are so many people doing great work campaigning. So it's not, you know, we're doing anything particularly new. But we thought we'd apply ourselves locally. And, um, and of course, we tried to do a few things. Um, how on earth do we move forward has become Kensington High Street. So, you know, again, very briefly, Kensington, Chelsea, the borough, 207 kilometres of road, not a single protected cycle lane. The main barrier to people choosing to cycle rather than use a car is safety and the perception of safety. And um, the main way of getting around that is physical segregation on certain roads. And we have none. It's just extraordinary. And despite sort of statements and nice words about, oh, yes, we want to be leaders in, 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 uh, in active travel. So we, we're, we're super pleased about the great support that Imperial College have given to this. Um, it's so striking that around in on the doorstep of the borough sit centres of global excellence on diagnosing and fixing the problem. <laughs> um, and yet, um, you know, you can learn more about sustainable transport within the borough on Imperial's website than you can on Kensington Chelsea's own website. Um, so it's great to have Imperial support. Um, and yeah, you know, delighted to take part in delighted to take part in this panel. Thank you. Thanks, Justin, and we're delighted to have you here. 
Um, so I'm just going to pick up on your, your point about barriers and, and, and kind of the individual barrier being around, you know, perception of safety. But, but more broadly, just thinking about what are the barriers to, to implementing, a, a, I guess, a holistic change in urban mobility. Um, and I was going to come to Audrey first, but she's, she, is that OK? She's, she's moved. She's doing some, she was doing some mobility examples while we were, while we were live. So, yeah, so thinking about barriers, and I guess all of you will have a slightly different perspective on where you see the key barriers are. Audrey, I wonder if you could just, uh, following up from Justin, which was very much about the behavioural or the, or the individual perception. That's right. Thank you. I was moving my wife. I was starting to get low where I was. Um, so yes, I, I uh, exactly what I think uh, Justin just said. I think the biggest barrier to uh, active travel is just not having the right environment for it. Uh, people are too scared to get off um, in many cases. And just it's I think it's a combination of the built environment not being conducive to walking, cycling, particularly to cycling. Uh, as well as the social environment, and they go together. The more people see other people cycle, the more they cycle, but they're not going to cycle until they feel safe to cycle. So there's a bit of a, a, a vicious circle. Uh, and the other bit of the vicious circle is to, ma to make that, that, that cycling environment ha happen. We also need to engage all, all members of society with us to put pressure on politicians to make it happen. I think politicians have a lot of pressure from uh, various lobbies, and uh, they, it, they, it's seen as a, as, as a very bold uh, uh, thing to do to, to touch the car. And they, a lot of politicians, I think, feel that they are not going to get reelected if uh, they touch the car. Now, we've uh, wonderfully been able to see that actually that's not necessarily the case. The, the mayor of Paris, uh, Mayor Hidalgo, was reelected while everybody thought there was no way she was going to get reelected because she so much tackled. Uh, the problem of in the city, yet uh, she wasn't reelected on that platform. So there's a bit of a perception that uh, a politician is not going to be elected, a perception that people are not ready for that change. But I think as we see, uh, particularly in what's happening in South Kensington, as Justin, I'm sure, will, can tell us more about, it's not a, the, the, the people are actually, I think, ready for that change. So yes, it's making that change happen. The built environment be conducive, particularly with cycle lanes, but in general, just reduction of traffic so people feel safe. Okay, can, while I've got you, Audrey, can I just follow up with a couple of questions from the Q&A? Because I think they are about, I guess, how people understand what choices they can make. And I think there's a lot of, I guess, lack of understanding about is an electric bike good or bad? Is it if I am choose to walk along a road that's got a lot of traffic, Am I actually better from a, a kind of a lung health perspective in a car than being exposed to that pollution? How do people, you know, I mean, that, that itself becomes a barrier. How do we how do we get around yeah. those, those things? Yeah, so in terms of the uh, air pollution and, uh, and walking and cycling, that happens to be one of the big, big components of my research is really on understanding that interaction of physical activity and, and air pollution. What we find is that at the, at the levels that we get in Europe, you can walk and, and cycle as much as you want as part of your daily lives. You will always get more benefits than harm from uh, from walking and cycling because the physical activity benefits outweigh by far the risk associated. In fact, both with uh, increased inhalation of air pollution, which indeed you do increase your inhalation of air pollution when you're cycling, uh, but also it, it outweighs the, the harms of traffic injuries. So it is a, uh, in a way a perception that, that you are going to put yourself at greater harm by cycling. The benefits you get from cycling are actually going to uh, always be be larger. So that's that's the good news. Um, and the first bit of your question was, was whether electric vehicles, uh, electric bikes, have a role, right? Because all your data yes. show that they're yes. not making a difference. And you know, there's the there's the question about batteries. Where's the yeah. role for electric bikes? Yeah, completely. So from the physical activity perspective, what we found in the also in the pasta uh, data, I didn't show you, but we did see that because uh, we didn't have a huge amount of, of, of but what we saw is that people do ride uh, uh, electric bicycles and most of the ours in our sample were in Switzerland but because they travel much further away they ended up getting the same levels of physical activity as people who use regular bicycles so from our study in fact the electric vehicles in terms of personal health brought the same level of of, of health benefits but that's because they cycled much further they used yeah. the electric bicycle because they went much further so from a physical activity perspective if it's use in that purpose, then it's much better. If in fact 
for physical activity. If in fact it replaces an, uh, a, a, yeah. a trip that could be made with a regular bicycle, of course you're not get a, getting as much. In terms of the health, uh, the, the environmental implications, of course, you'd be much better off um, by getting people on regular si uh, bicycles. Uh, you're, you, but you're. If the if the trade-off is a, an electric bicycle or a car, of course, mm -hmm. an electric bicycle is going to be better than than a car. Okay. Okay. So an electric bicycle is okay as long as we're using the electricity as a boost, right? Not as the whole journey. Yeah. Go for for people who are not physically able to do those distances. Okay. Yes. Okay. So George, I just from your perspective then, from Enterprise Holdings and, and thinking about um, you know the, the services that you want to deliver, where are the barriers to, that will enable you know companies like yours to make these changes? What, yeah, what do you think I, I, I think there's a there's a there's a couple of pieces. I, I, I would agree. It's interesting listening to everybody in the call. Like we're probably all in agreement. Um, it, it's you know, and, and our view is is choice is key. So, um, you know, if you want to in in encourage more active movement and cycling, you do have to have the infrastructure. So the cycle lanes do need to be there. They need to be safe. Um, uh, and, and, and again, we, we, we are, are, are big fans of that uh, as well. So a successful model um, need the choice needs to needs to be, you know, at the center of it so that the user has what they need. I think the distribution of the service is critically important. So if, if you take maybe a hydrogen car or an electric car, you think about mobility hubs. Um, do we want scooters and bicycles all over the place, free floating models, um, station to station? How we plan cities, um, you know, today public transport operators traditionally have always planned rail stations, bus stops, bus depots, and they were they were delivering a mobility solution inside that public transport solution. So I think an interesting debate that's happening today is you've got all these stakeholders coming together the scooter people, the bike people, the active movement people, the car people, um, the public transport, the technology companies. There's really two pieces of, of the model that need to be right. One is the platform, and I don't just mean its digital capabilities, but it, it needs to, it really needs to be a very ethically based platform with the right supervision and aligned into public policy. I, I can't um, stress that enough. And then the second piece then is how do you make it work? so the users get what they need so again we talk about if people want to cycle they need a cycle lane but if people want to think about going from a two-car household to one or a three-car to two or what have you you know to, to do that and then pick up those journeys that you want that are sometimes a car um that car needs to be accessible it needs to be convenient needs to be affordable needs to be clear where it's available and we see some very basic simple start to bubble back up when you explore that path even though it's very high tech um, and there's a lot of, you know, cluster analysis and data analysis. But one of the things we see that's critically important to users is a clean, well-maintained service. So whether that's a car or a rail carriage or a scooter or a bicycle, it's interesting as we get more and more into this, some of the traditional reasons why some companies have been successful in mobility are still key um, factors for users. So the missing piece, you know, you call it a barrier slash an opportunity, is probably true collaboration, good research backed foundation of where we want to go in a city. So as opposed to something that's that's that's, you know, um, it's always dangerous when politicians are on a relatively short cycle and they want to make a relatively radical shift in how the city works. You know, it, it, it's always I think it's always better if if the if we think the research is correct on how the city should be planned. We've engaged with the city and the people that work and live there. Again, I'm talking about urban settings. And then we try and deliver that service both te with technology and then with where are those hubs in those, those areas. It has to be affordable for everybody. There's some very interesting opportunities in the model around mobility credits. You know, it's very easy to, to wave your finger at somebody driving a 10 year old diesel vehicle and say you shouldn't be doing that, but they may not be able to afford to change their car. Um, they may not be able to see how else could I do this so, you know, innovative schemes, you know, that, that some have already popped up like a scrappage scheme. That's it's it's not a cash scrappage scheme. It's a mobility scrappage scheme. Things like that all help with consideration. So for us, it's important. The platform's right. The policy's right. It's available to everybody um, and it's a long term plan, but it can be delivered quickly in, in little pockets and, and uh, um, areas of, of, of trial. So, again, this hope is great um, just to be able to see some user experience. 
Okay, I'd just like to pick up on your your comment about you know equity and fairness there, Georgia. Maybe just a bar, but just to think about you know a lot of you know environmental green initiatives are, are often perceived as very kind of middle class endeavours and actually somewhat patronising to, to to the wider community. How, how do we make sure that we've got I guess proper engagement that that everyone feels like they've got proper agency and that and that we create policies that are you know compassionate and equitable. What, what again, and what's our role in doing all of that? Well, um, uh, it's a really good question, Mary. Could, could I just make one comment on the electric bikes just before I uh, yeah, please do. dig into that? So, so I think, I, I, so my personal view is electric bikes are very useful as part of the suite of options that we need mm -hmm. in our cities. And the reason I say that is because um, of course, there you, you know, cycling a regular bike is, is is a much better option from the point of view of of health. But if you look at the impediments to cycling, apart you know, apart from safety, which is a big one, obviously, it's wind, rain, your the age of the cyclist, and topography, and electric. You know, we can't do anything about the rain, and uh, unless you come from Ireland, in which case you don't care about the rain. You're well used to it. But 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 when it comes to wind, when it comes to a your age, when it comes to topography. The uh, the electric boost that you get from from the from the from the electric bike is a is a real sort of uh, uh, it's a real equalizer, you know, and, and a very useful thing. So I, I do think electric bikes do have a, a role to play as part of the suite of options uh, or the menu of choices to quote George uh, in, in our mobility solutions. Now, coming back to um, the perception of, you know, is is this a middle class issue for, you know, uh, um, you know, I think quite often, you know, we have lacked compassion in the past, and I think one of the things that we need to do is we need to, you know, really challenge the narrative and look at ourselves in the mirror and ask ourselves, are the choices that we make, you know, um, forcing other people into very poor choices, you know, and, and there definitely is the uh, thing, the definitely uh, uh, environmental nimbyism is definitely something that exists. You know, when we say we're going to ban cars on this street, where are they going to go? They're going to go to other streets, right? Is that a, and, and, and have a negative impact on other people? Is that is that fair? Um, you know, there was a great study in the US. I won't na name the company, but you know, there's these crowdsourcing applications where you know you can take uh, a census uh, um, sensor information from different vehicles, and you can make predictions about where where the most congested spots are in the city. And this particular company found that people were lying. They would art they would create artificial congestion to force congestion into other parts of the city. And of course, that's very, very unfair. So, so there is a need for compassion in this debate. There is a need to think to talk about fairness, and and sometimes we don't do that. And I think that's that's one criticism that could be, you know, could be could, could be levelled at me. You know, just to quote myself, you know, because um, it's a it's a big missing part of the the debate. Now, what can we do to 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 solve that? Well, I think this is where technology and policy can play a big role. You know, we all know about the policy interventions, but there's a need for new technologies here. You know, we need to move away from sole ownership models towards models where we have a different notion of ownership. And I think that's what George was alluding to, you know, where we we, we price access to devices rather than ownership of devices. So we give people the option to get into clean devices, to have clean solutions. Um, Maybe there's a role here for digital identity, you know, where we can, you know, we can really force polluters to pay. Um, you know, there's a lot of techno technological sort of, um, uh, a lot of technological innovation that uh, can play a role here in making sure that fairness and equality becomes part of the uh, environmental discussion. That would be my would be my view. You know, I I I sort of think I shouldn't probably make this analogy, but I, there's a quote by George by Oscar Wilde, another Irishman, which said, you know, I either want no corruption or more access to it. You know, they're the two options. I think sometimes pollution <laughs> is a bit like that. I either want no pollution, or if there's going to be pollution, then you know, let's have sort of fair and equitable uh, mm -hmm. impact on society. So, yeah. Sorry, Thanks. Mary. Thanks, and I guess I mean there's an aspect of this question in the chat which I think we're probably not going to get time to really dig into, but about the kind of the global nature of some of these challenges. Yes. And if we we move to Absolutely. electric vehicles, we we end up extracting lithium in yeah. some other part of the world, and, and the impacts yeah. of that. Um, and I think you know that's that's correct, and we and, and it's definitely something we should bear in mind. But probably we don't have time to dig into the the, the global nature of pollution today. I want to move over to to Justin and just think about um, just to think about policy. So a lot of the kind of things we've talked about obviously sit within a political framework, right? And so what what are the do you think the key political levers that, that could drive change? And and 
who's lobbying for what things and I guess whose voice is being heard and how do we make sure that there is a, a citizen voice in, in that in that aspect? And I know it's something you're fighting for. So what but what would what do you think are the key things that would make a difference? Yeah, I mean look, it's a huge topic, um, <laughs> which I'll sort of maybe give some yeah. snapshots on yeah. and, and I think even a policy topic any policy topic is conditioned by the environment with, within which that particular debate is taking place so if i think and let's take the case study of kensington um so we're you know here we are in the uk so we've got central government policy central government policy set out last may in gear change from the department for transport restated with new network management duty guidance for you know the whatever act clear no problem there um transport for london um well look yes they've got a clear plan for strategic cycle routes that's been up and running for decades one of them does indeed go along um uh, one, one of them one, one of them goes along uh, Kensington High Street um, and uh, and then you've got the local authority so in the case of London you know one reason it's such a mess is the local authorities control most of the roads transport for London controls just a few and then you've got different political parties at any given date will control different <laughs> of those organizations so you can have a government policy which is in favour, a Transport for London policy that's in favour, and then a broadly speaking non-existent Kensington Chelsea Council policy. In fact, a policy which, you know, today it's not by accident, there have been no segregated cycle paths at all in the borough. In fact, plans for ones on Kensington High Street have been blocked for decades. Um, so how does one you know that there are bits legally and I, I i don't know how it's happened to my life but i've got sucked into this <laughs> so there are bits legally that you can look at look actually some of the some of the you know details of legislation do we need to play with is the duty just when they say to move traffic expeditiously do we need to look at what traffic means um you know maybe there's some bits and pieces but then sort of fine but in the here and now on the basis that these roads are dangerous today um so you know so, i mean they're, they're really dangerous statistically dangerous today um, and the measure of danger isn't always just how many accidents it's how many people don't dare use them use them for active travel so you've got a really immediate problem like really immediate so lobbying for legislation great let's do that but in the near term you have to influence people and who are the decision makers fine well in this case it happens to be the councillors of Kenyon and chelsea so zero in on that who are they listening to? So one reason we were successful in our judicial review sort of initiation proceedings was that they didn't do the right type of listening to people. I mean, certainly they didn't do any leadership, so they didn't explain the issue. They didn't explain the benefits. So on a sort of, you know, on a on a on a on a on a public, if you like, whose day job isn't to sort of know everything about active travel, if you don't have an advocate then you're going to allow some sort of you know stereotypes if you like to, to to exist but then if you pick and choose who you listen to it just makes it worse so we've worked very hard to broaden that out so for example Kensington and chelsea deliberately decided not to listen to users of the, of the route so you think right so we have to work really hard legally to make sure they they listen to people who deserve to be heard but also you've got to communicate to them because perhaps they've lived in a context where they have been of the school of thought that, that London's not Amsterdam, you know, and we've all kind of heard that sentence. And you do have to actually think, right, I have to do my job in communicating to them, you know, the reason you're in a traffic jam isn't because of a bike lane that doesn't exist in Kensington and Chelsea at the moment. It's probably because of the cars which are mostly speaking doing a short journey with one person who's able bodied. I mean, is the reality. And putting those points across, demonstrating that, well, yes, there is more traffic. There are 50 million miles more traffic in the borough since every year since 2013. You know, rat running is up by whatever it is, 92 percent in the last decade. And conveying those points to people who I don't think anyone, you know, it depends on the borough a lot. And this is one of the policy stroke implementation issues you get, maybe haven't had those points put across in a connected way 
And then our job is not only, to, if you like, or it's become our job, has to be put those across, follow the legal arguments, but also bring people together, um, which maybe is the most powerful. You know, people think, well, who do I speak to about this? If you've got a council who are not interested, well, it's not a fun discussion to have, so you kind of don't follow up. So you need to make a nice environment to bring people together. Um, anyway, sorry. Yeah, I, I just just really see, I'm just going to follow up a little bit because there's a, there are a couple of questions in the chat, I think, that speak exactly to these kind of comments. And, and in particular, Simon, who's talking about it, where he lives, there's a London Liverpool Street project. Um, but there's a vocal and, dis and divisive backlash, right? So how do you, you know, if you even start down these initiatives and you try at the community level to make things work, but then there's you know, quite a, you know, the, we know there's quite a lot of vocal entitled people living in London. Um, once you start the initiative, how do you, how do you get momentum and how do you make sure that, that these kind of projects are successful? Uh, yeah, um, I mean, it's, it's uh, yeah. I'm sure there's not an easy answer, but. Um. There, there's not, but, it, but it's, it's absolutely at the heart <laughs> of the issue. Um, and <clears throat> I think, you know, number one, you sort of anchor yourself with, with information because you know hopefully you're advocating something which is true um, you know if you're not you should maybe have another think about what you're advocating mm -hmm. but if it is something that's true well why not equip yourself really well and find a way of being able to communicate that information very very well and then it doesn't become a sort of you know people like to say well look there are strong opinions on both sides yeah well, yeah. That, well that's not helping anyone mm -hmm. um let's sort of neutralize force of emotion and try and anchor it in evidence and fact in a cooperative way. And you might have to be really patient and you might have to think, oh, I'm going to have to sit through some meetings and I'll never get those hours back to my life. You know, mm -hmm. fine. Um, but you've got to sort of gird yourself for that, I think. But I mean, it does go back to the point that, you know, not every scheme for active travel has been brilliantly designed. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, not every scheme also you know, doesn't need to be amended a bit. Yeah. And and I think you've got to also be clear in your messaging that, look, we we sort of get that people are in one place. We're not going to be patronising. Mm -hmm. We're going to be trying to be really helpful. Yeah. Um, we're going to be really thorough in the approach that we take. And, and yes, we're going to be open-minded, genuinely, about what might need to be adapted, what might need to be amended. Okay. Thanks. That, that's you know really interesting, and obviously it's a, it's an extraordinarily complex issue. There's I wanted to we talked a little bit with George already about business models and and the ways forward, but I, I just want to touch a little bit on that with you, George. You know, it, where are we going to get to that will enable you know companies to be part of this transition? And and then Audrey, uh, just to follow up. So there's a question in the chat from Lud Miller about is there a, is there a role for subsidy in places like universities to help our students? become more active to access bikes and, and and how does that how do those things tension against each other kind of the subsidy space and the, and the business model space so maybe George first yeah I mean Mary it's coming there's no question I mean there, there's a lot of platforms and programs in place yeah. already um so so they some of them will fail they'll get learnings from that a new model will emerge I mean I think we all know that the, the government policy side is moving much faster now than it ever was it's going particularly fast in France um and in paris so um will a model emerge i think it will um which will be the winning model i think the one that's most user centric so once it's assuming it's aligned with you know the city's aspirations and the residents of the city i think it'll be like any other business model after that if it's affordable um, and users like it they will refer it the frequency will come with it and and a little bit of volume will probably allow the modal shift to start to take place because the more volume that comes into it, the, the, the more sustainable it is as well for the, the, the companies that are providing the mobility within the system. Um, and I do think incentives are critically important, not, not just obviously for students, but I think to incentivize people um, based on you know, where they're at in, 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 in their world, um, it has to be available to all. So there's absolutely nothing wrong with different types of pricing depending on the individual and you know if they need a bit of support to participate in the program it helps them get to work and it's a clean journey absolutely that should be part of the model and that's why i think government being involved is critically important okay thanks audrey well i think in terms of subs subsidies i think we can clearly say that that the car car travel is currently being subsidized so 
yes, if we want to subsidize, why, to, uh, to finance, then, uh, why not? That would redress some of the inequalities. But on the other hand, I don't think we need to necessarily subsidize with a financial incentive uh, people to do the right thing. I think once people have have started uh, walking, biking, uh, having that kind of active lifestyle, you see for yourself that this is, you know, brings so much uh, health, joy, happiness to your lives. The question is, how do you first m enable that experience to happen? I think that's something that uh, we've seen, particularly with COVID. Once people have tried it, they actually really espouse it. And, and I think that's, uh, instead of a subsidy is just allowing people to experience it and that's what we're doing with the hub the yeah. mobility hub we're announcing today is making that possible and it, just to piggyback a bit on that compassion issue i just saw some research recently that stated that green space improves compassion so if we can get rid of cars put green space we'll have a compassionate society bob did you want to follow up on that yeah i, I just in terms of the business model i just to answer the question it, it is a much cheaper solution than everybody owning a car so you know a group of people sharing a couple of cars let's say for whenever they need it you know you want to go to the airport or you need to go to UK or whatever you need to do uh, and then having your 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 electric bike or your regular bike for your other journeys that's a much cheaper solution than everybody owning a car so I think the business model is actually a good one here actually it's 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 a, it's a very compelling one if we get it right um, it just in, it going just to follow on what Justin said, I think when we talk to policymakers, I think it's really important for us, yes, to be informed of the facts and to be to be accurate, but also to challenge the narrative. I think sometimes there's a a, nar a particular narrative can uh, can 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 gen can gather momentum and it's never challenged. And I think you know before we go too far in one direction, it's important for all of us to to you know to to, to take a, st a step back and challenge the narrative. You know, electric vehicles will be a perfect example of that. You know, there is a there is a there is a you know, there is a, a a perception out there that I do no harm anymore if I have if I drive an electric vehicle. Well, well, electric vehicles are really important. Uh, they're a very important part of the solution. But it is not a case that you're not doing any harm if you drive an electric vehicle because, as I said, the lithium ion battery has to go somewhere at end of life. Uh, the, where it's extracted from, you don't know what the conditions are, you know, under which the lithium was extracted. And um, you know, they have tires. They contribute to congestion. And um, I think you know it's very important for us to challenge the narrative, and there are several there are several dubious narratives I think that are at play right now uh, when it comes to policy. Okay, Justin, I think you wanted to come in. I'm also I'm also conscious that we're very close to the end of time, yeah. so we're going to wrap up very quickly. But go ahead. Electric vehicles, just just to bring it back to sort of real life case study, Kensington Chelsea, great example. They've committed to a charge point within 200 meters of every everyone's house. Fine, no no problem with that. Um, in their green plan, uh, there's a sentence on active travel. That's not a summary. That's the extent of it. And um, and it says there's an aspiration to have a cycleway. That's undefined, by the way. So that could just be a sign, possibly. Um, within 400 meters of each person. So so interesting, isn't it? You know, yeah. unaffordable to most, within the reach of no children at all, who won't have driving licenses, 200 meters, something for everyone, possibly, yeah. maybe not usable, 400 meters. Yeah, it gives a it gives a clear statement of their priorities. I think yeah. <laughs> you are great. So I'm, I'm going to have to wrap up. I'm going to I'm, I'm going to take chairs liberty and let us go over it by two minutes. Um, recognizing that lots of people have places to be, but I just wanted to just to end with some, I guess, some hope, hopefully positive notes and, and, and ask the panel what, you know, what's the long term ambition? We're, we're starting this initiative. We're really trying to do some research and, and change behaviours and understand what drives change behaviours. But, but what's the long term ambition for, for this um, Imperial Enterprise Brompton collaboration, Audrey, just in, in 10 or 15 seconds? Uh, well, so we're testing out how uh, how people experiencing the hub can change their behaviors and long term ambition is that that would lead to more cycling uh, for staff and, and lower uh, uh, driving and, and uh, car ownership, but hopefully be able to scale it up once we have the good evidence that it can work. Mm -hmm. Bob, last word from you. Well, I, I think, you know, for me, the exciting thing is to move towards new ownership models, you know, to go towards a model where everybody has access to the right solution whenever they need it. And uh, I think that's not the case at the moment. And, you know, cars, bikes, electric bikes, you know, scooters, they all have a role to play. And I think it's it's enabling enabling choice and making access to that choice equitable and fair. That for me is the 
is it will, will hopefully what will come out of this. Okay. Justin, any last thoughts? And um, just to pick up on that word, in, enable, uh, mm -hmm. which I think I think is key. Um, you often hear encourage walking and mm -hmm. cycling, which mm -hmm. is nice. yeah. um, critical actually to enable it. Okay. All right, and George, last last word from you. Uh, Mary, again, thank you very much for, for, for today and, and, and the whole bike. I think it's all about six wheels to us. I, I think it's the marriage between the bicycle and the car and how that will work for people. But the reason we don't, we're doing it is to try and find out what people like to do. So I, I'm excited about the outcome and the research the students will do on the user experience. OK, great. So thank you all. I really want to thank all our panelists for an amazing job and also the people behind the scenes that make this work. So Connor and Catherine from the Energy Futures Lab and Alex from the, the TZP initiative and just there are, we recognize there are lots of questions we didn't get to answer hopefully the answers to those questions will start to appear on the mobility hub website as we engage in this research um you can see the website there keep up to date learn how you can be involved and, and follow the progress and uh, and yeah just thank you all for joining us and um i hope we enjoy the rest of sustainability week which which ends today but please remember sustainability isn't just for this week um please take it forward hope to see you all soon bye thank you thanks Thanks, Mary. Bye bye. Thanks, Mary. Bye. Thanks, all. Great to see you. Thanks. Yeah, thanks.